Hello, can you please confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. So let me briefly recall we began a new topic on mag magnetic fields in matter. Prior to that, we had finished some basic ideas of uh, electromagnetic theory. Faraday's law, Ampere's law, Maxwell's correction to Ampere's law, those things. Now what we shall do is uh, we shall look into the, uh, the behavior of magnetic magne magnetism in material medium. I mean, the principal uh, physical substance that we should have on our minds when we discuss this topic is that of a standard bar magnet. I mean, how does a bar magnet give rise to magnetism or display, manifest magnetism? Because we said that magnetism is the outcome of uh, charges in motion. So where do we have such things in a bar magnet? We discussed in the last class that magnetism is the consequence of many current loops on an atomic scale. Fine. And um, so in regard to that, we talked about an electron that is going around the nucleus. And uh, in so doing, the traveling electron forms a mini loop current. Of course, once again, I shall remind you that the cur a current is the flow of a positive charge. So although we are talking about an electron going around the nucleus, the current will be an equivalent motion of a positive charge in the opposite direction. So if the electron is going, let us say, in the anticlockwise direction, then an equivalent positive charge is to be seen, uh, hypothesized as going in the uh, clockwise direction. So that is how you should see a current. And uh, we ended at this point where we talked about the minimum irreducible value of the magnetic moment, just like the minimum irreducible value of an electric charge is the electron, or the minimum irreducible value of electromagnetic wave, that is light, is a photon, and so it is that the minimum irreducible value of magnetic moment is a magneton. And since the derivation of this formula is based on Bohr's postulate, one of Bohr's postulate about the structure of the hydrogen atom, um, it has also it also carries the name of Bohr. So this is the Bohr magneton. Okay, I mean, Bohr as in Niels Bohr, about whom you would have studied in your school chemistry. This Bohr model of the hydrogen atom, uh, we have planetary orbits all that kind of stuff. A transition from one orbit to the other by an electron requires an energy transfer of H nu, all those things. So basically, this is a quantum idea. And if you have the introduction of the quantum in any discussion of physics, Planck's constant H must make an appearance. So that is what it is. OK. So that's roughly the thing that you have. When you have a bar magnet, uh, you have these uh, atoms with little uh, electron loops going all around, and it, they form, uh, give rise to magnetism. We shall discuss this idea in some more detail, but we shall now first look at certain features of magnetic materials, because we are talking about magnetism. Uh, the broad topic that we are talking about is magnetic fields in matter. So. Uh, let us see. First, in polarization, I hope you recall, uh, let me just go back to an old diagram. In polarization, we have a dipole moment. Now, the dipole moment can be created in two ways. One is by distortion, whereby, let us say, you have a neutral atom, and the neutral atom is subject to, subjected to an external electric field because of which uh, the positively charged nucleus is pushed forward and the negatively charged electron cloud is drawn backwards 
And um, as a result, you'll have a separation of the positive end from the negative end, forming an electric dipole thereby. And uh, so this is a schematic representation of an electric dipole. But then there could be, but overall, um, the atom is an unpolarized object. It is just that under an external electric field, distortion has brought about the polarization. But then there can be various substances that already have inbuilt polarization, such as molecules, water molecule being a famous example. So when you subject such uh, systems to an external electric field, since they already have an inbuilt polarization, they don't undergo any polarization by distortion, but rather they orient themselves along the direction of the external electric field. Positive charge in the direction of the electric field and the negative charge will be in the opposite uh, end, at the opposite end. And so here also you have something like that. Just a minute, please. Sorry, just a minute. Yeah. Sorry. Give me a minute. Uh, I hope you, know, you all can see this thing. So magnetization is just like polarization, except that, uh, I mean, polarization by rotation, just like water molecules, which have inbuilt uh, dipole moment under an external electric field, they'll just rotate and uh, the, these dipoles will align themselves with the direction of the electric field, positive charge towards the arrow end of the electric field and the negative charge at the other end. And so it is that magnetic dipoles also show this property of alignment. Magnetization is this thing. Alignment of the magnetic dipoles under an externally applied magnetic field. Okay. But here we have some further distinctions. In the case of electric polarization, if you have an electric field given by an arrow, then the positive charge in the dipole will always be in the direction of the in the uh, direction of the outward going arrow whereas the negative charge will be in the opposite direction but in the case of magnetism or magnetic materials this alignment can happen in various ways so let us see first so first is the case of paramagnetism in which the magnetization is parallel to the external magnetic field b Magnetic field has been applied to a magnetic material and the dipoles are aligning themselves parallel to the direction of the external magnetic field. So there is an alignment with the magnetic field. So that happens in the case of paramagnetism, simple discussion. And uh, usually you know, such things happen in the case of uh, systems where the atoms of uh, the system have an odd number of electrons in the electron cloud. So magnetization is parallel to B. Okay, this second thing is of diamagnetism. This is something that doesn't uh, have any uh, equivalent example in electric polarization. In the case of electric polarization, the dipoles will always align themselves parallel to the external field. But in the case of magnetization, there can be situations whereby the dipoles will align themselves anti-parallel to the electric field, anti-parallel, meaning that there will be a 180 degree angle between the direction, sorry, the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the dipole, 180 degree. When you have parallel alignment, the angle trapped between the two vectors, namely the magnetic field vector and the magnetic dipole vector, don't forget something, magnetic dipole is also a vector. So these two vectors are pointing in the same direction, therefore there's zero angle between the two. But when they are anti-parallel, meaning uh, oppositely directed, the, di the dipole is opposite in direction to the direction of the magnetic field. In that kind of a situation, you will have diamagnetism and typically uh, it happens when the atoms of the system have an even number of electrons. So those are, I mean, these are just simple descriptions. There are great many details into which we can't go really. That's not really a part of the syllabus, but if you were to ever study solid state physics and magnetism, 
these things are vastly interesting uh, features and um, a good deal of research goes into all these things, subject of serious study. And then the third thing, ferromagnetism. In ferromagnetism, okay, I've mentioned something. Magnetization is retained even after removal of B. Let us first look at uh, electric dipole. Electric, not magnetic. You apply an external field. Let us see. Let's go back to our little schematic diagram. You apply an external field. The positive charge is pushed forward and the negative charge is drawn backwards. Fine. As soon as you switch off the electric fields, this positive and negative ends will again collapse upon each other. So the dipole character will be lost. It's only the external field that is creating the dipole. Similarly, when you, so that is, this is the case of a dipole, a formation of a dipole by distortion. Uh, when you apply, uh, when you have uh, uh, polarization by rotation or alignment, uh, the dipoles tend to align themselves parallel to the electric field. But as soon as you switch off the electric field, again, the, this tendency, this discipline of parallel alignment with the electric field will be lost. All the dipoles will then become randomly oriented as before. So it is, same, the same thing happens in the case of paramagnetic materials and diamagnetic materials. You apply an external magnetic field, the paramagnetic dipoles will align themselves parallel to the magnetic field. Fine, that's all right. But um, and similarly, you apply an external magnetic field. In the case of a diamagnetic material, the dipoles will be aligned opposite to the direction of the magnetic field. Fine, but it's still some kind of an anti-alignment, let us say. It's going in the opposite direction. But then, in both of these cases, as soon as you switch off the magnetic field, all the order that was established will be lost. So there will be no alignment, either parallel as in the case of paramagnetism or anti-parallel as in the case of diamagnetism. So all the dipoles will become randomly oriented once again. And uh, so the overall magnetization will be lost. But that doesn't happen in the case of a ferromagnetic material. In the case of a ferromagnetic material, first of all, the alignment is parallel to the external field, as in the case of paramagnetism. Fine, that is all right. But if you switch off the external magnetic field, then also the magnetization is preserved. The magnetization is not lost, as it happens in the case of para or diamagnetic material. So the material becomes a permanent magnet, as you call it, ferromagnetism. An example of such materials are most commonly known, iron, Fe, uh, then cobalt, and nickel. But iron is more commonly available, so most of our experience of permanent magnets is with iron. So magnetization is retained even after the removal of the external magnetic field. That is the property. So in order to get deeper into this thing, uh, we shall first have to define magnetization. So far we are talking about magnetization as in, in terms of alignment. How do we quantify that? Here is the formula. Just like in the case of the polarization vector, capital P, how is the polarization vector defined? The sum of all the dipole moments divided by the total volume of the substance. The same thing is done in the case of magnetization vector also. It is the sum of all the magnetic dipole moments per unit volume of the substance. So you can immediately see in the case of paramagnetic and diamagnetic materials, if you do not apply an external magnetic field, all the dipole moments will be randomly oriented. And randomly oriented vectors, they will tend to cancel out one another. And overall, this summation will be zero. Overall, nearly zero or zero. But if you apply an external magnetic field, then in the case of uh, paramagnetic material, they will all, uh, the dipole moments will all add up to give you a substantial number. Same thing happens in the case of the diamagnetic material, except be very careful be very careful in uh, following what I'm saying now. In the case of the diamagnetic material, uh, I mean, this dipole moment 
the sum uh, the vector is to be uh, standardized with respect to the external magnetic field so the dipole moment total dipole moment of a diamagnetic material being a vector will have a negative sign because it is opposite to the external magnetic field i hope you have understood that one particular point this doesn't happen in the case of electric dipoles there the alignment is always in the direction of the electric field and as a result the polarization will show a positive value uh, but in the case of paramagnetic material of course it will have a positive value but in the case of diamagnetic material the vector sum will be oppositely directed and therefore it will have a negative value um, in the case of ferromagnetic material again it's in the direction of the external magnetic field and so the vector sum will once again have a positive value so that is <clears throat> the discussion of magnetization. Let us now move on uh, for some further discussion. Um, this is about bound currents. When I'm talking about bound currents, I shall advise you to recall our discussion on bound charges as in an insulator, bound charges. Let us try to understand what we mean by that. Um, in the case of an insulator, so what is the difference between a conductor and an insulator? In the case of a conductor, you have a whole lot of free charges. Fine, that is good. But in the case of an insulator, there are almost no free charges because the, in a conductor, current is actually carried by an electron. Although, once again, I will emphasize, it's theoretically, it's not the flow of the electron that is to be considered as a current as the current but rather an equivalent flow of positive charges in the opposite direction but whatever unless you had free electrons the equivalent flow of positive charges in the opposite direction wouldn't happen either so a good conductor has got a whole lot of free electrons but uh, an insulator that is a dielectric doesn't have free charges so the charges are bound to the parent atom unlike a good conductor, well, let's say copper, where the parent atoms form bonds among themselves, and in so forming uh, uh, the bonds, uh, they give up electrons. Uh, so these electrons have just keep floating around. And eventually, under potential difference, they will uh, conduct a current. So um, here also, as in the case of insulators which have bound charges follow this point carefully charges give rise to electricity currents give rise to magnetism fine in an insulator these charges are bound so they do have electricity but the current is not very prominent and so it is that magnetization of a magnetic material as in, let us say, a bar magnet, there is a bound current. Because unless you have a current, you can't have uh, magnetism. Very simple thing. Ampere, Maxwell, Faraday, all of them. Well, not so much Faraday, but Ampere and Oersted, I'm sorry. Faraday gave the opposite argument. Changing magnetic flux will give rise to an electric field. Whereas changing uh, electric flux, a uh, flow of charges, will give rise to a magnetic field. So worsted and ampere on one side electricity to magnetism and faraday on the other side magnetism to electricity and all of them were theoretically packaged by maxwell uh, okay so here you have let us say a magnetic material a piece of magnetic material let us say iron here we have we are talking about bound currents there is no free current what do i mean by a free current that under a potential difference across this material there will be charges coming in from one side positive charges coming in from one side and leaving through the other side and as a result you'll have a current flowing through this material those things uh, are the standard flow of a current under a potential difference but here we are not talking about that we are talking about bound current so current bound in tiny loops contributing to an overall surface current let us first try to understand this statement <coughs> let us see what it means here is this situation uh, you have let us say little atoms here I'm just 
giving a very simplistic diagram. The reality is far more complicated than this. But I hope this simple diagram will help you understand the whole uh, basic concept of what is being discussed here. So here you have a slab of magnetic material and these are little atoms with the electron going around the central nucleus. So you can see this is the arrow of an electron, a little loop electron. Focus your attention to this first circle and the second circle. At this point, the arrow is going from left to right. And here, the arrow is going from right to left. So these two little arrows are oppositely directed. So if you look at this small region of space, the two oppositely directed arrows are cancelling out each other. Similarly, within the bulk of the material, here also you can see this arrow is going in this direction and this arrow is going in the left direction. So they are cancelling each other. What is not being cancelled is the arrow of the loop that are at the border of this material. Let us see. Here you have an arrow going this way, anti-clockwise, right to left. But on this side, there is nothing to cancel this arrow. So it is here, so it is here, so it is here. So at the edge of this material, you have these boundary arrows, which are not being cancelled anything on the other side of the boundary. As a result, it would look like that there is an overall surface current going all around the perimeter of this material. This surface current is IB. This surf it's, it's not a real current that your common current that you uh, understand uh, when you apply a potential difference across two ends of a conductor, a copper wire. It's nothing like that. It is just that these little loops, atomic loops are uh, creating, I mean atomic loops have electrons going round and round and as a result there is an effective current in each atom and these tiny loops at the surface of the material will give rise to an effective bound current. Bound meaning, as you can see, this current is not coming from anywhere, not going anywhere. It is just keeping going round and round in circle. You don't even need to apply a potential difference for this current, right? So it's just happening because uh, of the Coulomb attraction and the centrifugal balance, all those things inside the atom. And all of these atoms collectively give rise to the surface current at the edge of the material. So current bound in tiny loops contributing to an overall surface current. So that is how it is. And so all of these things will have a little dipole moment. Every one of them will have a little dipole moment uh, of its own. And all of these dipole moments, as per this formula, added together will give rise to an overall magnetization vector. So you take a look at this little loop current, apply the right-hand rule. What is the right-hand rule? The right-hand rule is given here. Here you are. You have this current going round and round, and this is the magnetization, uh, uh, sorry, the dipole vector perpendicular to the disk containing the circle. If this is anti-clockwise, apply the right-hand rule, take your right hand, Stick the thumb upwards, that's the direction of the magnetic dipole, and these curling fingers uh, will give you the direction of the current. And so each of these little loops will have that sort of a feature. This is the direction of your curling finger, and the little magnetic dipole will be sticking upwards. All of those magnetic dipoles added together will give rise to this overall magnetization, capital M. Okay. So if you have a current, normal current, the kind of thing that you're familiar with already, across the wire, you have a cross-sectional current density, current per unit area. So if you have a current, current is the flow of charge through some uh, material medium. So here also you have a current like that. And uh, if you have that current, then you also have a cross-sectional current density. Current is I and the cross-sectional current density is J. IB, the subscript B as in bound. So JB is also the cross-sectional bound current density. Okay. So due to the, these, this is due to the bound current loops. 
I'm not deriving anything over here. I'm just stating this formula. Curl of M is equal to JB. So it takes some work out to derive this formula. I'm just stating it over here. Curl of M is equal to JB. What is M? M is this overall magnetization vector. And take the curl of that, you'll get the bound current, cross-sectional bound current density. I'm advising you to put this thing next to what you have already studied, polarization vector. You take the divergence of the polarization vector, you'll get the negative bound charge density. Now, in the case of the magnetization, in the magnetic context, divergence is replaced by curl, polarization is replaced by magnetization. Polarization as in an electric dipole or a dielectric material, that is replaced by magnetic magnetization. Incidentally, you can't have polarization in vacuum in empty space. And similarly, you can't have magnetization in vacuum in empty space. You need material for both polarization as well as magnetization. But uh, you can have the electric field E in vacuum. And likewise, you can also have the magnetic field B in vacuum. But both P and M will require a material medium. And so curl of M, so here on the right hand side, you have charge density, bound charge density. Here you have bow cross sectional bound uh, current density. But there's also a minus sign over here. There's no minus sign over here. So that causes a little difference. We shall see about that soon enough. OK. So now, just like I told you in the case of conductors and insulator, Nothing is a perfect insulator, nothing is a perfect conductor. Good conductors have high conductivity property and low insulating property. If it did not have any insulating property, um, then it wouldn't have any resistance either. So all good, even good conductors have some resistance, right? Whereas insulators are high resistance material, so they have a lot of bound charge, but a very weak amount of free charges. And as a result, insulators uh, do not conduct current very easily. There may be a so small a trickle of current that you will not even be able to realize it. So uh, the bound charges control the insulating behavior, and the free charges in a conductor control the normal current kind of behavior. More free charges, better the more you have free charges, better will be the conductor, and vice versa. And since we are talking about charges in the co context of polarization, now we shall have to talk about current in the context of magnetization. And so the total current density will be the cross-sectional bound current density, as in this situation, plus cross-sectional free current density, which I have not drawn over here. So suppose there were to be a potential difference through a battery or whatever applied across this slab of ma magnetic material, even iron will conduct some current, by the way. So it's a, it's a metal. So metals tend to be standard conductors. Copper is, of course, a very good conductor. But uh, it'll still co conduct a current in the case of iron. So free current will be due to charges that are sweeping in from one side and sweeping out through the other. And these are bound charges. So together, uh, taken together, they will be contributing to the total current and therefore the total current density. Bound current density and free current density. By density, of course, I mean cross-sectional current density. So current per area. OK. This is something that we are familiar with. Curl of B is equal to mu naught J, which is Ampere's law, plus mu naught JD, which is Maxwell's correction to Ampere's law. JD is epsilon naught del LT of E. OK. So under steady conditions, steady conditions as in when things are not changing in time, statics as in electrostatics and magnetostatics, del del t, things are not changing in time, so time derivative will give you a zero, del del t of E will give you zero, and therefore the displacement current density will be zero. There should be a vector zero here. There's an error. I'm sorry about that. Please just make a note of that. Uh, just a minute. So there should be a vector zero here. And then you have curl B is equal to mu naught J. So uh, which is something we have discussed many times earlier. Curl is replaced by divergence in the electric context, B by E, mu naught by 1 by epsilon naught, and cross-sectional current density by charge density. Remember, electricity and magnetism are two faces of the same coin known as electromagnetism. If you have the one, you must have the other, and vice versa. 
I mean, you can't have a coin only with a head or with a tail. So it is like that. Okay. So what we shall do now is that we shall take this equation, curl of B is equal to mu naught J, and substitute them J with uh, JB and JF. JB and JF. And so you will have, and then you take the mu naught to the left hand side. So 1 by mu naught into curl of B is equal to JB plus JF. And what is JB? By this formula, which I have stated over here without deriving, curl of M is equal to JB. So we write, substitute this thing, JB is curl of M. And then we have a curl here, we have a curl here, we take both the curls on one side of this equation. So curl of B by mu naught minus curl of M is equal to JF. A curl of B by mu naught minus M is equal to JF. Now we define a quantity called H. This quantity is called H. H is equal to B by mu naught minus M. And that curl of H is equal to JF. Uh, let us go back to our electric formula. When we talked about polarization, um, electric displacement vector, capital D, is equal to epsilon naught into E plus P. We have done this thing when we talked about, when we discussed polarization, electric displacement vector. Um, we, you should not confuse the electric displacement vector by Maxwell's displacement current. Although the word displacement occurs in both occasions, in, in both uh, situations, but one displacement should not be confused for the other. So this is electric displacement vector, capital D, D as in displacement. Okay, D is equal to epsilon naught into E plus P. Let's look at the magnetic formula. D has its equivalent in magnetism. D in electricity has its equivalent in magnetism as H. E as in electricity has B in magnetism. Epsilon naught in electricity has its equivalent in, in 1 by mu naught. Unfortunately, there is a slight problem with the rest. You would have imagined that going by this nice symmetry of head and tail, both faces of the same coin, on one face you have E, the other has B. On the one, first face you have one, you have epsilon naught, in the other you have 1 by mu naught. In one face you have D, the other face you will have H. So therefore, you would have think that in one phase, since you have P, polarization, the other phase should have M, magnetization. However, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen because here you have minus M. The symmetry is a little broken because of the presence of the minus sign. Now, why, where is this plus minus difference or breaking of symmetry coming from? It is coming from this. You see, if this minus sign would not have been there, then this whole thing would have been just the same. Or if this minus sign, if the minus sign would have been here, then P would have been replaced by M. But no, P is in this coin kind of a metaphor uh, analogy, P is replaced by minus M. Because here in this formula, you have a plus cross-sectional current density, but here in this formula, you have got minus bound charge density. So that causes the difference here. So, and also, I just like to draw your attention to something. Curl of H is equal to free current density, cross-sectional current density, whereas divergence of the displacement vector gives you the free charge, electric charge density. So here, at least, that symmetry is maintained. But here, plus is replaced not by plus M. Plus P is replaced not by plus M, but by minus M. Okay, um, just give me a minute, please. I'm sorry, just a minute. Yes, okay. So now, 
we have talked earlier about linear dielectrics and in the context of linear dielectrics i mentioned to you concepts like isotropy and anisotropy one of your tutorial problems had this idea what what did i mean by anisotropy that if electric features electric properties are the same isotropy in isotropy you have the electric properties being the same in all directions but in an anisotropic material you'll have different electric properties in different directions you just think of the three coordinate directions x y z in an anisotropic material the electric properties will be different in three different directions so that is an anisotropy and i also gave you the example of carbon allotropes of car carbon graphite for instance graphite has got very weak mechanical strength in one direction but has got very strong mechanical strength in another direction so materials fabrication uh, if you want to make very strong material out of carbon you'll just have to exploit the strong mechanical features in the direction where such features hold and then in linear dielectrics we have seen that if you apply an external electric field then there will be a greater distortion in the case of atoms or greater alignment in the case of molecules whatever be it uh, the polarization vector will become stronger with the uh, so let, let's just talk about uh, polarization by rotation stronger is the electric field greater will it uh, will it impose discipline on a system and all the electric dipoles will fall in line fast enough so as you keep applying the electric field by larger and larger degrees your polarization vector will also keep growing and you say a simple polar uh, linear behavior this is like y is equal to m into x x being e and y being p and m is the proportional constant epsilon naught into the electric susceptibility where do we get this formula from we get this formula from here if epsilon naught and e epsilon naught e can be added to p then p and epsilon naught e must be dimensionally the same so epsilon naught into e and then this dimensionless constant chi e is the electric susceptibility similarly in magnetism you also have something like that you follow the discussion carefully now however once again you would have thought that uh, I keep saying that polarization can be replaced by magnetization, E can be replaced by B. You would have thought that fine. Then going by that simple thumb rule, I can immediately get a linear relationship between magnetization and uh, the mag magnetic field by this P to be replaced by M, epsilon naught to be replaced by 1 by mu naught, electric susceptibility chi E to be replaced by magnetic susceptibility chi M, and the electric field E to be replaced by B you would have thought that would be the simplest thing to do unfortunately that is not correct uh, it is not correct because once again because of that plus minus business and also this epsilon not on one upon mu not business but we shall see we, we, it's not you will not be completely wrong in making that surmise but we shall see how that happens instead of writing this formula the linear features i mean this formula is also a linear formula 1 by mu naught and chi m are constant quantities so this is again y like y is equal to m into x however historically b was not used h was used in fact there is a good deal of confusion about what is to be called as the magnetic field the magnetic field b is what we call the b is what we call magnetic field now but there was a time when people confused h to be the magnetic field and so magnetization is proportional to the externally applied magnetic field and so you have this uh, h standing for that so we are still uh, retaining that kind of a terminology however when we talk about magnetic field we clearly understood that we are talking about b not uh, h so this h field i mean uh, there is a discussion in david griffiths uh, about this whole business um, i will later tell you where you can find that discussion uh, i think it should be in chapter six uh, yeah somewhere there mm. if i can find it i should let you know maybe i'll, I'll let you know later yeah it is there in chapter six 
chapter 6, uh, the auxiliary field H. There it talks about, uh, I mean, there's, it's, it's uh, interesting that, uh, I mean, here it's written the unhappy term magnetic field. I'm reading from the book, page 271. Make a note of the page number, David Griffiths, the book you have already, page 271, chapter 6, section 6.3. Section 6.3, and there at the bottom of the page, page 21, it's written, sorry, page 271, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, page 271. Many authors call, I'm reading from the book, many authors call H, not B, the magnetic field. So then they have to invent a new word for B, the flux density or magnetic induction, all such things. So we, these are absurd choices. Anyway, B is indisputably the fundamental quantity. And so we shall continue to call it the magnetic field. H has no sensible name. Just call it H. Then there is a quote from a standard famous textbook on electrodynamics by Arnold Sommerfeld, where it is written, the unhappy term magnetic field for H should be avoided as far as possible. Don't call H the magnetic field. That is what the author says. The unhappy term magnetic field for H should be avoided as far as possible. And here is something interesting thereafter. It seems to us that this term has led into error none less than Maxwell himself. Even Maxwell made the mistake of referring to H as the magnetic field. So easy, as you can see, these things are not really very easy. And we are talking about very intelligent people like Faraday, Maxwell, Ampere, all of these. But even then, there was a lot of confusion about these concepts, these ideas in the early days of the subject. So that was why you will see, for, for, for instance, I've given you one such example earlier also, electromotive force. Electromotive force is no force at all. It is a scalar quantity, which is energy. Electromotive force is just the work done to move a charge of unit value all around a current loop, in a closed loop. So that is electromotive force. But you can very well ask me, you are saying it is work done, and then you are you applying the term force. Of course it is wrong, but historically that was how it was, and so uh, we are still... Uh, abiding by that. Or take the very basic idea of a current. We call current the flow of positive charges. But in reality, there is no flow of positive charges. There is just the flow of electrons to conduct the current. Therefore, we have to say that the current is an equivalent flow of positive charges in the opposite direction. And so all this HB business also has got a good deal of confusion. But however, I'm stressing this thing. Um, B is the magnetic field. So now, in a linear media, just like in a linear dielectric medium, uh, you take polarization as proportional to the electric field. So it is that in a linear magnetic medium, you take magnetization as proportion to the magnetic field. However, as I said, because of some historically erroneous understanding, it, H was taken instead of B. And I, I mean, I've just read out to you, even Maxwell was not immune to this uh, mistaken understanding. So anyway, so you have got a situation where we, by you have got a linear formula, H increases, M increases, fine. So now let us look at this formula. Just a while ago, we established this thing. H is equal to B by mu naught minus M. So H is equal to B by mu naught minus M is chi M into H. We are substituting this M by this formula, chi M, into H. Therefore, B is equal to a little bit of algebraic work over here. H, taking the, all the H-containing terms to one side, H plus chi M into H will give you 1 plus chi M into H, and then this mu naught taken to the same side will give you B. B is equal to mu naught into 1 plus chi M into H. Also, from this formula, B is equal to mu naught into H plus M, 
you can get the same thing b is equal to mu naught into h plus m and that will give you mu naught into 1 plus chi m m substituted by this formula chi m into h you'll get mu naught into 1 plus chi m into h okay so as once you have that thing then we can proceed now b is equal to you have you can see this whole structure b is equal to mu naught into 1 plus chi m into h this whole package i'm writing as mu mu is equal to mu naught into 1 plus chi m so b is equal to mu into h okay so h is equal to 1 by mu into b okay and then we go back to our old formula m is equal to chi m into h fine and since h is equal to b by mu we have got m is equal to chi m by mu into b so we are not completely wrong either although we would have thought it should be so you, you have got epsilon naught over here and you should have mu naught one by mu naught here you have chi e here you have chi m here you have e here you have b here but when you are doing it with a non i mean in empty space this formula will not hold but here it will hold magnetization is equal to chi m into h and h is equal to b by mu naught and so you can now compare that with this thing d is equal to epsilon into e m will be equal to 1 by you would have thought that you will have 1 by mu into b only but um, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. H is equal to 1 by mu into B, and D is equal to epsilon into E. So as you can see, these two formulae are in keeping with our um, uh, transferring of quantities from electricity to magnetism. You have E here, you have B here. You have epsilon here, you have 1 upon mu here. You have D here, and you have H here. So uh, D is replaced by H. B is replaced by, sorry, E is replaced by B, epsilon naught is replaced by 1 upon mu naught, and P is replaced, well, not by M, so there's the symmetry breaking that is happening. However, in this formula, that thing is carrying over. D is equal to epsilon into E, and H is equal to 1 by mu into B. Okay, and then you can write this thing, magnetization is equal to chi m into h, where h is replaced by b by mu. So you have got a whole lot of formula over here. Make a note of these two pages, page 132 and page 133. Uh, you can use these formula for various kinds of problem solving. And then this one last thing uh, on this particular topic, just like you have uh, relative permittivity. What is relative permittivity? Epsilon by epsilon naught. And similarly, you have relative permeability. What is relative permeability? Mu by mu naught. Mu by mu naught is mu r. And that is equal to 1 by chi m. Chi m is the magnetic susceptibility. Mu r is the relative permeability. And mu naught is the permeability of free space, whose unit is Henry per meter. Epsilon naught has the unit of Farad per meter. And this thing has got the unit of Henry per meter. Okay, we have talked about linear media, as in this thing. This sort of a situation holds in the case of uh, ferroelectric, uh, sorry, uh, paramagnetic and diamagnetic material. You apply an external magnetic field, you will have uh, magnetization, positive magnetization in the case of uh, paramagnetic material uh, and you will have a negative magnetization in the case of diamagnetic material so here how will you capture that uh, in this particular formula you apply an external field magnetization increases if it is paramagnetic material chi m will be positive if it is diamagnetic material chi m will be negative because magnetization in the case of diamagnetic material will be opposite to the magnetic field you apply the magnetic field in the x direction, the magnetization will happen in the minus x direction. So between the two of them, there is a 180 degree angle. And so chi m will capture that uh, negativity, negative sign. And so it will have a negative magnetic susceptibility. 
but both will be linear meaning if you were to plot b versus m b along the x axis and m along the y axis vertical axis and horizontal axis you will draw a straight line passing through the origin more b greater m you will also have a straight line in the case of a diamagnetic material except that the slope of the straight line will be negative in the case of a diamagnetic material but what about ferromagnetic material because ferromagnetism i told you has this property that even after you set b equal to zero that is to say you switch off the external magnetic field m will not go to zero magnetization will be even after the removal of b so how will you uh, capture that with the help of this formula well short answer is that you can't let us see b is equal to zero m is equal to 0 as per this formula and that is what happens in the case of parallel in the case of a paramagnetic and a diamagnetic material uh, major difference between the two being that when b is positive m is positive for paramagnetic material but when b is positive m is negative for diamagnetic material and that negativity is captured by the chi m value plus for paramagnetic minus for diamagnetic but what about a ferromagnet when b is equal to zero in the case of a ferromagnet m will not be equal to zero but this formula is not designed to capture that feature well the answer is that a ferromagnetic material requires a different kind of formula because it's a non-linear me uh, magnetic medium here we have talked about linear medium a linear media but uh, there it is non-linear let us now try to understand certain features of this whole non-linear business let us see what is it like? What do I mean by nonlinear? Anything that is not like a straight line is nonlinear. If you had drawn a straight line, it would have been a straight line through the origin, as in the case of a paramagnetic material. So, in the case of a paramagnetic material, you would have had a straight line passing through the origin like that uh, on this side. In a diamagnetic material, you would have had a straight line going in this direction. But in a paramag in a ferromagnetic material, something very different happens. Let us now try to see. First, uh, I've written a whole lot of things. We shall discuss these whole uh, whole lot of things one after the other. Nonlinear medium, dipoles interact among themselves, domain alignment in a ferromagnet. What is this so nonlinear medium? What do I mean by a nonlinear medium? The plot of B versus M is not like a straight line. Uh, that is what you can see in this diagram. You don't see any straight line drawn over here. Uh, straight line would have been in the case of para and diamagnetic materials, but in a ferromagnetic material, it's nonlinear. So, where is this no linear, nonlinear are just mathematical terms? Um, we are not doing math here so much as we are doing physics. So, something has to, some explanation has to be offered to reason why you have this nonlinear behavior here is a, some answer dipoles interact among themselves consider a paramagnetic material paramagnetic follow carefully in a paramagnetic material all the dipoles are randomly oriented so no dipole cares for the orientation of another dipole right but in a ferromagnetic material dipoles have interaction among themselves as a result now you follow this point extremely carefully although i'll tell you where to read all these things from the dipoles have a tendency towards order among themselves what do i mean by that if you have two neighboring dipoles then they would rather tend to be aligned in the same direction in the case of a paramagnetic material the dipoles have no such interaction among themselves or for that matter a diamagnetic material so the dipoles are the dipole doesn't care what the neighboring dipole is doing in the para or the diamagnetic material but in a ferromagnetic material these dipoles so you have got let's say two dipoles they establish a little bit of order between the two of them so they did align parallel in a certain direction then the next dipole next to that will also 
align like that. So there is already an inbuilt tendency towards discipline within this material. As a result, large chunks of this material will have aligned dipoles already in built between them. Such, such chunks are known as domains. So the domain within a domain, already the dipoles are aligned. Domain alignment in a ferromagnet. So it is just like, let's say, the difference between a law-abiding country and a lawless country, Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, there is no law. Everybody is carrying a gun. And if you have the gun, you establish your own law. But in law-abiding countries, uh, not so much in Delhi, incidentally, our national capital, but in many other parts of our country, you have people respecting the law and uh, you have inbuilt discipline. You obey traffic rules. You don't randomly loot people on the roads. So there is a tendency you, you don't litter the road. Nobody is telling you not to do that directly, but you have an inbuilt sense of discipline. So the domains are like those pockets of discipline, pockets of already aligned dipoles in a ferromagnet. What happens is that, why is a ferromagnet so easy to magnetize? The answer is that when you apply an external magnetic field, it is not so much that the dipoles align with the external magnetic field, but this entire large chunk, the entire domain that aligns with the external magnetic field. And of course, the number of domains is far less than the number of dipoles. You'll have dipoles of the order of Avogadro's number, which is a very large number, something of the order of 10 raised to 23. But the domains contain dipoles and the domains are far fewer in number. As a result, it is easier for the external magnetic field to align the domains rather than the dipoles. But that's why it's easier to control I mean, just let me give you an example of Indian history. The British were very small in number. About one lakh Englishmen or British were ruling in India, and India was a country of 30 crore people. How did they manage this thing? Very simple. One answer is that, that they did not control all of India directly. They controlled all the Rajas and the Maharajas of India. And the Maharajas and the Rajas of India established order in their own kingdoms. So all that the British had to do was to control the Maharajas and the Maharajas were aligned with British rule. And as a result, the British found it very easy to control India. That is how. So the Maharajas kingdom is like a domain and within the domain, all of the Maharajas subjects obey the Maharaja. But then the Maharaja himself obeys the Queen of England. So the Queen of England is like the external magnetic field and the Maharaja's domains, uh, the Maharaja's kingdoms are like the domains and the, the kingdom subjects are like the dipoles. And so it was very easy for the British to control the Rajas and the Maharajas. And as a result, they were able to control 30 crore Indians being no more than one lakh Englishmen all over, I mean, one, one lakh British uh, all over the Indian subcontinent. One lakh will not even fill up all the seats in the Motera Stadium of Ahmedabad. Just consider that fact. Uh, so that is how it is. But what about a paramagnetic material? In the case of paramagnetic material, you will have to you will have to control the dipoles individually. There are there is no inbuilt domain in a paramagnetic material. As a result, a paramagnetic material is not so easily magnetized. As soon as the influence goes away, it uh, the whole uh, uh, magnetization business crashes down. That is the example of Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, everybody has his own law. And as long as the Americans were there, they were, there was some semblance towards discipline and order. So the Americans were like the external magnetic field. As soon as the Americans left, there being nobody to impose order locally, everybody ha has brought out his family firearm and all lawlessness, complete lawlessness has taken over the country. So that is like a paramagnetic system.
Okay, so I hope with these examples of states and countries, I have been able to give you some idea about the difference between a ferromagnetic material and a paramagnetic material. In the case of a ferromagnetic material, it is not so much that the dipoles are aligning in themselves with the electric ex external magnetic field, but rather the whole domain align themselves with the external magnetic field. And since domains are far fewer in number compared to dipoles, which is how it, dipoles make domains. And so domains are much smaller in number, so it becomes easier to just shift a few domains and bring about alignment uh, in the ferromagnet. I mean, the domains can be misaligned with each other, uh, but under the external magnetic field, they will fall in line. This is just like, let us say, uh, the Marathas were oppositely aligned to the Nizam. So you have two domains, they were not aligned with each other, but the British came and made both of them fall in line, along the same line, so like, like that, something like that. So uh, yeah, now what happens to the magnetization versus the external magnetic field diagram? So what is this whole non-linearity business? Let us now try to see. Once again, I told you, ideally I should be plotting B against, sorry, M along the vertical axis and B along the horizontal axis. But just a while ago, I read out that there is a little bit of, con there was some historical confusion about the role of B and H. So people would rather be plotting H along the horizontal axis. But I haven't done that either. I have written I here. Why so? Because of this thing. When you apply an, a current in an electromagnet, I hope you know what an electromagnet works like. You use a solenoid. And N subscript L is the number of turns in a solenoidal wire over unit length. So this is a pure number. Follow this point carefully. N is a pure number, number of turns. N subscript L is the number of turns per unit length. Number of turns per unit length means pure number per length. And this is I which is current. So put together, they will have the unit of current per length, ampere per meter. H has therefore the unit of ampere per meter. And since, as per this formula, H and M are being added to each other, so whatever be the unit and dimension of H must also be taken up by M. So both M and H have the unit of ampere per meter. Okay. And B, of course, I mentioned to you, has the unit of Tesla. Let's see. Uh, but let's get back to this formula. So the confusion, historical confusion, was that M was being plotted against H, but H is proportional to I in an electromagnet. How do you change the value of an X magnet? If you have a bar magnet, you can't change the value of the magnetic field. To change the value of the magnetic field, you'll have to change, use an electromagnet. You increase the current. And as a result, H will increase. Once again, I stress, it shouldn't be H, should not have been H, but B, but there was a historical error or misunderstanding. I shouldn't say error, misunderstanding in doing so. And so this number of turns per unit length of the solenoid is a constant quantity. So H is proportional to the current. So rather than writing H over here, you might as well write the current value over here. So this current times a constant will give you H. So that's why I has been written over here. So now let us see what happens to the magnetization. Follow the diagram now. Let us look at the diagram more closely. In this diagram, uh, you have started, let us say, with an unmagnetized piece of iron, soft iron for preference, Fe, iron. OK, uh, you've put it inside a solenoid, and you are measuring its magnetization. And uh, so, uh, you apply the current, slowly you will see the magnetization increase. You notice in this diagram that a straight line has not been drawn. The increment initially will be slow. Had it been like a straight line, the increment would have been faster, but initially the increment is slow, and then slowly it is picking up. Once it is picked up, it will reach a point where it will saturate. Hereafter, if you keep increasing the current, M will not go any higher, M will remain flat. What does it mean that M is not going any higher, M will remain flat? 
hereafter if you keep increasing the current it means that the magnetization has saturated you can't get any greater magnetization than that now when will the magnetization saturate the magnetization will saturate when all the domains in a fer in the ferromagnetic material would have aligned i told you a ferromagnetic material is easier to align uh, because it's the domains the alignment is happening on the scale of the domains and not the dipoles and so when all the domains would have aligned there is no further scope for the magnetization to grow and if the magnetization is not growing then regardless of however high a value of current you put in the magnetization will remain flat at the so then you decide okay there's no point increasing the current any longer let us now reduce the current now as per your linear formula which holds in the case of para and diamagnetic materials you would have expected that as b is reducing or the external field is reducing m would also be reducing right but uh, yes it is reducing but there is something different that happens as you keep decreasing the current the magnetization will keep going down but it will not retrace the original path of its growth you notice that i have drawn an arrow here this arrow is increasing the uh, indicating the direction of the growth but once you switch it to, uh, uh, start reducing the current the return path will not be the original path the return path will come down this way and uh, so when the current goes to zero this will be the value of the magnetization where this path intersects the vertical axis this whole value of magnetization starting from the origin up to here is known as retentivity retentivity as in retaining retaining meaning you are keeping that although the external magnetic field is now zero the magnetization has been retained that is the hallmark of a ferromagnetic material that is how it goes the hallmark of a ferromagnetic material is this and you said okay fine but uh, i don't want this material to retain its magnetization so your material even without any external magnetic field or any external current or whatever has become a permanent magnet the value of the magnetization of the permanent magnet is given by this point where the m function is intersecting the vertical axis it's retained magnetization so the next thing you want is to drive out the magnetization completely so what do you do now you have to actively work against it you apply the current in the opposite direction remember from here to this side is positive direction of positive current from here to the left is negative current so from here you are going to the left you have negative current and so as just a minute as you are applying the negative current the magnetization will reduce and eventually at this point when you have reached the current value over here the magnetization will finally become zero but that magnetization where it becomes zero requires a current in the opposite direction not zero current it requires a current to be flowing in the opposite direction so that amount of current flowing in the opposite direction which brings the magnetization to zero is known as coercivity coercivity as in the word coerce c o e r c e the english word coerce means force like uh, you keep saying china is coercing its neighbors to give up territory trying to coerce taiwan all these things you will hear political uh, so coercing so you apply an, a negative current and that will coerce the magnetization to come down to zero so this vertical thing retentivity is the magnetization of a permanent magnet without any external field and an external uh, current and this coercivity is the uh, zero uh, is the value of the negative current that will bring about zero magnetization thereafter if you keep decreasing the current the magnetization will become negative it will go down below this vertical axis here you have then it will saturate i mean whatever you have over here will be repeating itself here and then once again when you start increasing the current so you can see it will keep going down and down and here it will saturate and then 
again if you start increasing the current in the positive direction it will keep going up this way and it will follow a new path not this path again this path will never be traced again it will just go once up here come down here and then from here it will again go up and come back to the same point so this whole diagram is known as a hysteresis diagram the term hysteresis i think it's got something to do with retaining memory or something like that uh, it's uh, yeah so i'll i'll clarify this thing in the next class i can't re re recall it exactly right now so anyway uh, so that is the little discussion that we have had now let us look at this formula once again. I hope you have understood the whole idea of a nonlinear medium, nonlinear medium, because now you know where in this diagram you'll see a straight line, number one. Why is this nonlinear behavior arising? This nonlinear behavior is arising because the dipoles are interacting among themselves and are contributing. They have an inbuilt sense of discipline within the system, and that is aiding this magnetization process. Okay. And this zones of discipline among dipoles are known as domains when an external field is applied is the domains that align with the external field and you have um, quick ferromagnetization and in the case of ferromagnetic material um, for zero external field magnetism is retained so I've just written something over here, H is equal to NL into I. I've written this formula to explain why we take I along the, vert along the horizontal axis. Now let us go back to this formula. B is equal to mu naught into H plus M. Okay, I told you H and M will have the same unit. H has the unit of ampere per meter. NL is just number of turns per unit length of a solenoid. So ampere into number of turns per unit length of a solenoid. H has got the unit of ampere per meter. Therefore, M must also have the unit of ampere per meter. In reality, what happens is that M becomes very, very much larger than H. The H field, which has no real name really. B is the magnetic field. M is the magnetization. But H, H has got the same dimension and unit as M. And it becomes very much larger than H. So you can neglect the H against that and you can write B as proportional to M. So here you have something like that. B is proportional to mu naught into M. And uh, so there is one last point I'd just like to touch upon. Uh, I talked about paramagnetic material uh, and I talked about ferromagnetic material. And I talked about domain alignment. In a ferromagnetic material, you have domain. The domains are zones where the dipoles have frozen themselves into a state of alignment among themselves, a state of order. Now, in school, I think you would have studied something that how to destroy the magnetization of a good bar magnet. You have a magnet. How will you destroy the magnetization of that magnet? So you can strike the magnet with a hammer. You cause mechanical damage to it. You can do that. Heating can also cause uh, magnetization to be lost in a good bar magnet. So all these things happen. It is this, these, these things that I've just said are connected to this feature called phase transition, ferromagnet to paramagnet and Curie temperature. I'll just give you a simple example. Uh, this is the last topic that I'll talk for today. A simple example, consider ice. Ice is what? H2O molecules frozen in a solid crystalline structure and giving very nice looking crystals, ice that is. But what happens if you supply heat to a cube of ice? The uh, H2O molecules frozen in their position will start vibrating and eventually the vibrations will become so strong that the structure will collapse just like in an earthquake when the ground shakes the buildings vibrate and if the ground shakes very vigorously the buildings can't maintain their strong vibration for too long the buildings break down and so it is in the case or except that in the case of ice the breakdown is not brought about by an earthquake but by supplying heat the heat is causing vibration of the molecules and they break down and at zero degrees Celsius, as we have defined, or 273 Kelvin, um, the ice structure will collapse and you'll have formation of liquid water that will fall down in a puddle. 
Okay. Something similar happens in the case of a ferromagnet. Instead of ice or H2O molecules frozen in space, you think of the dipoles, the ferromagnetic dipoles frozen in a proper structure called domains. Now, if you hit the ferromagnetic material with a hammer, it will cause vibration just like an earthquake can cause vibration in a building. And if the, hit, the way you strike it is too strong and vigorous, then the vibrations will be too strong and the, do, the, the domains will start losing their alignment. I mean, the dipoles within the domain will start losing their alignment. Give you a minute and I'll finish this discussion. Or you can supply heat. So the dipoles, just like the H2O molecules in ice, will start vibrating. And if the vibration is too vigorous, then also the domain uh, structure will be lost because the dipoles will then shake themselves free from this frozen orders of alignment, frozen uh, or order in which they have been aligned, forced to be aligned. So just like ice to water, on the application of heat undergoes a phase transition, solid phase to the liquid phase. So it is that these domains, when they break down, the ferromagnetic material will lose its ferromagnetic property and become a disordered ferromagnet. A disordered ferromagnet. So that is what it is. Just like to give you some example, I gave you Afghanistan. There was order. Suddenly, the external field is gone. There's disorder. You create trouble in the country. Or maybe like, let's say, Iraq. Saddam Hussein was ruling Iraq with a strong hand. There was order. The Americans came in and supplied a lot of heat, created trouble, and order in Iraq was lost, and now there's complete lawlessness. And so it is that a ferromagnetic material can become paramagnetic material on this application supply of heat, just like ice can become liquid water, solid ice, solid crystalline ice can become liquid water, water on the supply of heat. And this thing happens at a precise temperature. This is just like a phase transition. Phase transitions happen at precise temperatures, zero degree for ice to water, 100 degrees Celsius for water to steam. And so it is that a ferromagnet to paramagnetic material can also happen. And the precise phase transition temperature is known as the Curie temperature. Curie temperature, Curie as in Madame Curie and her husband Pierre Curie, so like that. So I, I think in the case of iron, the Curie temperature is 770 uh, degrees Celsius or something like that. So if you heat iron to 770 degrees Celsius, you'll have uh, this thing, a phase transition from a ferromagnetism to paramagnet. Iron will become a paramagnetic material. Anyway, so I have, shall stop the discussion now. Time is up. The one minute that I uh, saw it is also up. Today we have a tutorial. I'd just like to briefly mention something about the tutorial. I've stopped sharing this discussion, by the way. I'd just like to briefly mention something about the tutorial. We shall continue with last week's tutorial. There were five questions left to be discussed. So we shall take up those questions today. I shall supply you the link. I've already supplied you with the solutions of all the first 10 tutorials in your Google Classroom. And for tutorial 11, last week I also supplied you by email, but it still requires some correction, a little bit of correction here and there. After they have been done, the uh, solution set will be uploaded in your Google Classroom. So at 2 p.m. we shall meet today for completing the remaining questions of tutorial 11. If you have any question to ask from your side, you may do so. I shall stop the recording meanwhile. Otherwise, we may leave now.